Right, so uh, once again, we are here uh, with Nate. Here I am. You may remember, we actually did a tour of uh, After Nam of yes. the Yamaha uh, synth room, which was awesome. Yeah. And uh, it did really well. Very helpful to us because because of that video, we ended up getting the DX1 we didn't it was have. Missing, yeah. So you have so to come back. This Public service. Yes, thank you. But we're here now, uh, as we've been, we're doing a few videos from here. We're over here in uh, Japan at Hamamatsu, which is the Japanese, uh, the, the, the headquarter, the mothership of yeah. the Yamaha Corporation. Or why, is it the music or, or all of Yamaha? Well, here is, main, is mainly music, music right. oriented things, uh, more sister companies than than uh, you know the same umbrella, but it yeah, definitely you know shares the name for sure. So uh, we figure there's, there's this. Uh, um, is it, this is normally open to the public. Yeah, this is a uh, so this is Innovation Road Space. The building we're in is very new. This is built new building that was just opened, uh, I think, last year. And one of the um, one of the big features of this building, of course, nice new modern offices and that sort of thing, but Innovation Road kind of celebrating all Yamaha music product history, and there's some really cool well, stuff inside. I mean, it started in like the 1880s, didn't 1887 it? was when Mr. Yamaha, who's actually a feature here this oh. year, this is, this is actually a picture of Torokusu Yamaha. He was, the, there was actually a Mr. Yamaha, and this is him, and he got started um, with, because he was interested in fixing things and he helped uh, some local folks here in Hamamatsu fix their uh, pump organ. And we can go in and we'll see an organ much like... This feels like a cue for uh, maybe we should, roll cameras. Oh yeah, yeah, here, let's go in. So, right. you can see. So, um, yeah, we have this amazing space. And like I said, it's all, all Yamaha products, all music products throughout history. So pianos, violins, woodwinds, but of course a heavy emphasis on synthesizers. We've, we've been you know, making synthesizers now for 45 years. We started in 1974. And there's some really cool synth history inside of this room. Brilliant, well, let's go. You, do you want it? Should we? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> First of all, do they actually have the, the organs? The original organs. That yes, they had. There's, there's the first organ we ever produced. Okay, we need to start. We there. should start okay. there. We should start there. Yeah. Now, this is actually the first electronic organ we ever made here, the D1. So that's the first electone. Yeah. And people wow. know know the electone brand. That was, you know, we we still make electone uh, organs today, ma mainly for the Japanese and Asian market. Um, but this was the very first uh, electone organ, 1959. You can see over there is a little placard, placard there. But uh, you know, very <laughs> electronic for for the day. Transistor would it have been at the time, or was it? Would, uh, I think even before trans so 1959. It have, so it would probably been tone wheel, I'd imagine. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe so. I this I don't know a whole lot about, but that that launched our organ technology. Up until then, you know, pianos were, had been one of our main things. Right, but. Fast forward 15 years and you have the GX1, which is, I like to call it, it's probably the, you know, it's the mother of all Yamaha synthesizers because this instrument was essentially two CS80s in, internally and an SY1. Um, and it was an amazing instrument. It had things like memory. It had uh, cards you could put in it, into it to change the sounds. I always, I always love this. This is a little knee lever. So as you played, you could use this as a modulation source. You're, <laughs> you get your knee into it and, and you could do different things to the sound like filter cut off or change the volume. It's meant to be super expressive. Well, it's, it's really interesting. I did a bunch of research on this because uh, this was actually, uh, we were hoping that this was going to be making yes. noise, but sadly yeah. it's out of service. Yeah. But, but there were some facts and figures, folks. Okay. The central bit weighs 300 kilograms. This part is, this part is 300 kilograms. Yep. The bass pedals, another 87 kilograms. Yeah. There's a speaker system that comes with it as and well. Two speakers, two speakers, giant speakers, giant speakers right? Speakers. Both of the, the full set, if you like, 952 kilograms. So yeah. Nearly one metric ton for, yeah. a, for a musical instrument. A ton of fun right there. Oh, you're sharp. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, and there are people who toured these. So guy, uh, Benny Anderson from ABBA. John Paul, Jones, John Paul Jones. Keith Emerson. Stevie Wonder used one a lot on the songs of the Key of Life. This was the, the Dream Machine. Did he call it the Dream the Machine? The Dream Machine. And in fact, um, I think Stevie has two. If you go to Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in Las Vegas, 
he gave one of them to Madame Tussauds and he's there playing, you know, set up playing it, a wax figure of Stevie with it. I, I wonder if they even know, like, you, you know, the, these are pretty valuable these days. Well, so. when it came out, uh, it was like 60 grand, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, which is about, what, 300? 300, 300 yeah. Grand, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, and the, 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 in a lot of ways, this is the sort of precursor to Yamaha investing in you know, various technologies, because this would have cost like a couple of million. I've read it costs like a couple of million quid to kind of, in the R&D, in the build. And, yes. you know, get, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. like insane. And which, that, that, that amount of money now, that's, uh, that's tens of millions, hundreds yeah. of millions. Yeah, and and I, I agree. Like I, I think this was a technological sort of muscle flexing for Yamaha at the time, and um, you know it it started basically all of Yamaha synthesizers because that technology made its way into the CS80 and the SY1 and all the instruments that that uh, came after it. And to me, this like when I talk to people about Yamaha synth history, there's there are. Th there's threads that go from this thing all the way to montage. And it's it's the expressiveness of it. Like, look at all the control, look at, oh, you have to see this. Look at this keyboard, look what you can do. That's you like can, aftertouch, right? Yeah, well, or, <laughs> or something. but it goes side to side too. Oh. So you can do pitch, and I think this did, um, uh, you might be able volume to do some kind of yeah. volume, right? I and did look, not know that. The ribbon control. You have the ribbon control there. I already pointed out you have this knee controller. All the different ways for the human being to use their, you know, use their controls to express themselves. Did the keypad so that... have poly aftertouch as well? Oh, that's ones? a good question. That I don't know. That I don't no, know. No, it doesn't feel like it. It, doesn't, it feels very organ-like. Yeah, yeah. And this is interesting. Like, this action is very shallow compared to a synth. Like, a synth action feels deeper, but this is very much an organ short throw type type action so well it's a beautiful thing it is it is and so, did you did you catch the chrome on it like it's so 70s look uh, at that yeah, it's beautiful. oh here's another one sorry come on over here look how you adjust the seat so that's what it's so called. you can move it up and down it's a motor in it is you it you can move it back no wonder it's that's why those 900 pounds so went. it's got yeah. massive yeah, ma yeah exactly so another thing that's really interesting about yamaha is as well as when they started out they were it was mechanical stuff they were doing mm -hmm. And they also made bows and arrows in archery. It's really big in uh, Japan, right? It, it is, but you know, Yamaha has a history of craft type, type products, so required some pretty significant woodworking skill. And even today, um, Yamaha is big in, in woodworking. We make um, uh, interiors for luxury cars, you know, the nice wood panels. Oh, okay. We have the technology to create really, really fine, refined um, wood, so it's uh, yeah. That's there's both really a craft side of Yamaha, but the tech technology side as well. well you know. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, I love this. Yeah. I've never seen one of these. I never. I actually never have either. And that's an got interesting a special, one. That's a design by Mario Bellini. So that's. I guess that's an Italian label. Yeah. Cassette. Yeah. Wow. I thought a Bellini was a drink, isn't it? It is also. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know. I, I had that. Every time I come in here, I see no, something different. A pair of NS10s there, or an NS10 there, which yep. does not look like it's been spending its life in a non-smoke-free studio. No, no, it might have, uh, yes, it might be a little smoky. And well, then NS1000s as well. Oh, yeah, I remember yep. those guys. Uh, there's just so much There's here. so much. There's let's so much, let's keep looking. There's some, there's some interesting... What? Hold on. Oh, this, yeah. This, this is, so this is a Yamaha mar artificial marble. So that's something that you guys kind of... Well, it's a, it's a countertop, but you guys... So the hotel we're staying in, you pointed out that you saw Yamaha. Uh, yeah, there's a Yamaha sticker on the on the sink. And then you asked me, it's like, oh Nate, do you go every time you come here? Do you put the little Yamaha label on there? But no, we do these sorts of yeah. fixtures and you know craft type materials as well. So there's so much to see here. Well, I, we'll have to, we'll just have to keep going. Early, this was something I didn't know. Early computers, I knew about some of the computers. I've never seen this one before. The PU120. But this was more of a personal computer as opposed to something like the CX-5 and CX-7 and C C-1. Those were dedicated music computers. Wow. Of course, the KX-5, DX. Um, tubular bells? Tubular, yeah. Ah. Nah. The GS-1. Um, so the GS-1 and GS-2, the first FM synthesizers we released, and a lot of people know the DX-7 and think of that as the first. That was the first programmable FM synthesizer. 
But with the GS1, of course you can see more of that woodworking, 88 key um, action, wooden keys, and it had presets. And uh, you have to come back to the synth space at NAMM because I have a GS2, but you it feed, had, feed them in little. You, you feed the, the, these in here. The GS1 is a dual four op engine. So these little sort of uh, popsicle stick size side uh, magnetic tapes, you put in there, it reads one half, you flip it around, it reads the other half, you have two parts of one sound. And that's what the GS the GS1 was. The GS2 could play one of them, so it was a single right. four operator synth. So. Oh man, there's just so much stuff. C C CX FM. CX7M, I think that was a Japanese only model. I've never only seen one model. of those, hold on. Let's CX7M, let's see if I can reach that. Yeah. Wow. See the dual cartridge slots on it? Yeah. And DMP7, which is a classic mixer. Classic mixer, That's one the of the first, first one. with yeah. flying faders. Yeah. I mean, at, at that price it point, was, yeah. a digital mixer that was affordable. And of course the bassoon. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and a tennis racket, I mean, you know, and golf clubs, I think even today. And Yamaha's, a ski boot. And a ski boot, you know, we've into all sorts of stuff. Wow. And um, pianos. I mean, one thing that we, we don't, you know, the, CF, the pianos are, and they are really high grade. I mean, they're considered amongst, amongst if not the finest, grand pianos. There is it. What's the the, the, the mother load? The, the mother load is the CFX, which is somewhere in here. Yeah, over here. And I'll, I'll point out something interesting about the CFX. It's the one people are playing because they can't yeah. can't keep their hands off of it. So I, I always love to tell people this story about the CFX. This is an instrument nearly 20 years in development, 17 years or so. And the goal is they wanted to make an instrument that would project over a, um, a symphony orchestra. Ah, okay. And so I know Yamaha pianos like the C7, a classic studio piano, they have this reputation as being really bright. Well, this is very controlled and it can be very dynamic at low levels or it can be very very muscular, and, and this is why we we record this piano to put in our stage pianos, synthesizers, that, so that sort of thing. But I think you'll notice something really interesting. So if you look, this is a you know a CX grand piano, and you notice the lid is polished and and shiny. This this lid, you know, this is arguably one of our most expensive pianos. It's a matte finish, huh. but the reason is. If you're playing it in a symphony orchestra and the light shine down in it, it will reflect back and blind the orchestra, basically. So, <laughs> use case. Wow, <laughs> they decided okay. to make the top of it uh, a matte finish so that didn't happen. Right. I mean, it's a big old... It's a, it's a nine-foot nine foot 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 foot. grand piano. Wow, it's a thing of beauty, isn't it? Yeah. Really is just absolutely gorgeous. And there's a there's some characteristics about this instrument so as I recall from when I when I worked more with the acoustic piano team this detail here Yamaha pianos didn't have kind of this this sharp detail you can see uh, well maybe you can anymore. Yeah, but I think it, they yeah. picked it up they picked it up now but I, this was one of the first ones I recall to, to have that kind of look but it's a it's a remarkable instrument <laughs> and, and be careful if you're moving to, putting the lid down, the lid must weigh like, I don't know, 50, 75 pounds or something like that. You don't want to take it down by yourself because it'll, if you're not yeah. ready for it, it'll, it'll come down really fast on you. And then of course we come over to uh, some more beautiful electronic instruments. Yeah, so the synthesizer land, some of the classic instruments here, the aforementioned DX1. There's a specimen um, here in Innovation Road. Check, you can check out, uh, you know, just, just another thing, piano heritage. Look, this instrument had wooden keys, polyphonic aftertouch, two DX7s basically under a single hood, but the first synth really to combine, to have the concept of combining voices and making a performance mode out of two voices. And that's a concept that even Montage has yeah, to this well, day. Yeah, everyone, everyone uses it. Now. Sure, it's, sure. It's the cornerstone of multi-timbrality. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, and then the, the, C, the CS80 here as well, you know, probably the most, uh, I would say our most legendary synthesizer. Um, it's uh, iconic, isn't it? I think. It is yeah. iconic. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing instrument. And, you know, we just looked at the GX1, but look at a lot, you know, think about the imagery of that. The, these kind of organ style switches. I was working with a guy 
the guy who, who's doing our Yamaha synth story, who did the music for that, he was like saying, oh, these, these sliders work backwards. I go, no, think of them more as draw bars, you know, think of them as in an organ setting. He goes, okay, that makes sense. But that's the heritage of this instrument. It came, it came from that sort of, uh, that sort of vibe. And uh, then there's a VP one. I mean, that there's only like two of these in the world, isn't there? There's very few. There's very few. I know there's a guy in LA who I've talked to before, and we've borrowed his from time to time. He has one, um, but this is this is um, you know another example here, kind of the other side of the VL one. So the VL one was a model of a tube, a uh, physical model. This physical modeling synthesizer, the VP and the VL. Um, for VPs of virtual percussion or virtual pluck was kind of the, um, the uh, right. that's what VP, VP meant. And this was based more on a struck model. So it would struck, you would strike like a cymbal or a mallet or something and you could, it, it would excite the system and reintroduce energy into it. I mean, it. advanced kind of stuff. Yeah, and again, this wood, this is wood. This here is so wood. It this, is actually walnut, is it? It's actual. Uh, Looks like walnut. Uh, yeah, sure. I think so. Well, uh, well, actually, no, that looks a bit like elm. The, and, anyway. the, and the VL had this same figuring on it, the, the actual wood top. But uh, yeah, maybe we can come back and play this a little bit because it, it, yeah. it makes some really cool sounds. And then, of course, some of the other classics. We've got yeah. uh, EXs and SY70. A lot of people swear by this. SY77 and SY99, um, you know, kind of the, the end of one chapter of our FM era with these two instruments, the, because the instrument that came after it, the SY85, didn't have any FM in it at all. But these took samples and FM, and you this, could combine was this them together. Was this the beginning of AWM? Was this the AWM set? Yes. The first one, right. Yeah, because the previous instrument, the V50, was still FM. It had PCM drums in it, but it didn't, it didn't combine the two engines. Whereas the SY77 did, it also had a pretty extensive sequencer. I had one of these in college, and, and Played with it. It was great because I was an arranging, you know, a jazz comp major, so I could do horn charts on it and actually hear what stuff sounded like. Um, EX5 at the end of the 90s basically had all of our technology in it. You know, VL, um, uh, the AN technology, like the AN1X virtual analog technology, of course AWM, and formulated digital signal processing FDSP which was great for doing, modeling the behavior of like uh, electromechanical guitar pickups ah, and uh, okay. electric piano pickups. Because uh, you guys are also very um, very hot on component model technology as well. I mean, yeah. that's another thread, you know, the VCM stuff. Virtual is, circuitry yeah. modeling, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there is another room with some more DSP in it. Maybe yeah. we could go and have a look. Yeah, we, we could. And as we go through here, this is kind of a cool area because it shows, oh, yes, the... shows reface, but it shows the inspiration for, for each reface. So the CP inspired by the CP80, uh, CP electric piano, the YC25D. Now, this is great because look at, look at this top. Look at this color. I, I love this and this panel. It's so just, you it know. It is a very beautiful thing. Yeah. It's, this is absolutely pristine, isn't it? Yeah. It's... And it, this one did bass pedals as well. That one has the pedals, yeah. And then the FMs? Of course, the classic FM, DX7, and then the Reface DX. Although the Reface DX, kind of its own thing, you know, there's not another FM synth we ever made that has this same kind of FM technology with feedback on every operator, the ability to have negative and positive feedback. Well, when I reviewed this, one thing I found was really effective was to set it up with a load of MIDI controllers controlling sure. those feedback, because it starts to become a really alive thing. And that's the thing that's always held FM back, right. is there's no obvious kind of UI for it in yeah. terms of physical, the physical control, so. And did you, have you, seen the Detronics controllers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we got the Reface uh, Detronics controller, and yeah, to that point, it puts all that control right on it, and it kind of gi it gives it this new dimension when you, when you use that. But what's weird is none of the knobs do what you expect them to. It's not like you get this beautiful graduation between things. It's like beautiful, really ugly, beautiful again, right. ugly, beautiful. You know, so you get these transitions through all sorts of weird stuff. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the... Uh, see, I played with this earlier today, actually. Yeah. Um, we did a little um, uh, Friday Fun synth jam while we were here with the CS and uh, 
the uh, CP1, which uh, came out really well, actually. Yeah, this, the CS is pretty interesting because it's essentially five synthesizers in one. You, you have five different synthesis types under this uh, oscillator control. So a sawtooth, uh, you've got pulse width modulation, um, you've got ring modulation, FM, I forget what this one is, I'm forgetting now, uh, sorry, but uh, it's the jet lag, that's the jet lag talking. But when you select each one of these, these yeah. two sliders so different become stuff. different macro controls yeah, for different it, things. It, it and it had its origin in this little guy, the CS01, which is, uh, I remember, I remember this, there was, uh, this was the original one, there's a CS01 Mark II that came in different colors, like you get a black or a red one, and it had a breath controller in yeah, it, yeah. so you could do stuff with filter control, that sort of thing. Right, we were, we were on our way somewhere else. We are, we? Yeah. we okay. were, we can be. So of course, oh. uh, Yamaha drums as well. Yamaha we drum. put, Look got... at the silent brass uh, mute for a tuba. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That but if you put that in, it has DSP built into it. You can plug headphones into it and you can practice. I need to hold that for scale. This is how big that is. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. mad. That's funny. Yeah. So you need a separate flight case for your tuba. For you, so you can play your, yeah, so you can have headphones for your tuba. And the uh, SG100 and 200, 1000 and 2000, these yeah. are very, very highly regarded guitars. Yeah, yeah. We're in DSP land. DSP land and kind of uh, pro audio and, and groove land. Um, oh, oh, here, that's going to start. Wait a minute. Wow. <laughs> and this is the, Robot so land. Here we, we go. We were trying to figure out how to start this up, and yeah, it sounds it like it's actually going to start. So this. OK, so what's happening here? We got, di so of course, disc clavier technology. And you see the holograms here behind. All right, and then we got the bass player. Yeah. We should probably move away so the mic. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, in many ways, that's kind of rounded up the, the top. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but before we go, we've got um, a wall of uh, groove boxes, drum machines, TX7. Love the TX7. Um, I used to use this because I collected FM voices. And yeah. I had tons of them. Rhythm machines, R1X, I saw some of the Yamaha Music Space. Yeah, all the uh, MU series for doing MIDI files, really cool stuff. Um, and all the, the Line 6 line stuff. Six, is... Line 6 stuff, our partners Line 6 and Steinberg as well. Um, oh, one of my favorite things is the old, uh, the old PM1000. That's how you're gonna. That's how you're gonna mix your uh, your live gig with this, loaded with transformers and and, and iron. But uh, well, they, they, yeah, I did. A, I last time I came to Japan was in the nineties, and I did the sound for a band, and it was on a PM maybe three thousand or four thousand. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! It, because when I came, it had all been completely reset. Okay. And I had absolutely no, no idea <laughs> what I was doing. Yeah. And I had to get the house engineer to set it up for me so I, I could mix it. Yeah, and there, there's probably no U YouTube in the days to like uh, help me out here, so. Well, I think we're gonna have to wrap things up because the band are getting yeah. jazzy. Yes. Nate, thank you so much. Cheers, Nick. That's really good yeah. fun. <laughs> See you next time. Ciao. <laughs>